Let me, let me start by introducing quickly our panelists and then we'll dive into questions. So I'll start with Gabi, Gabi Cazo. She works for Harlan Capital, a fund with a mission to change the face in, of entrepreneurship by investing 1,000 diverse founders over the next few years. I don't know if many of you have heard of Harlan Capital before, so that's great that Gabi will bring uh, to us a little bit about their, their thesis. But they are introducing many innovations uh, on the way that VC typically works. For example, they have uh, founders uh, split carry, so it's a, a community carry uh, in the fund. So they are all interested in everyone succeeding. That's amazing. We would love to hear more. Welcome, Gabi. Then we have uh, Gabe. Gabriel Vasquez is a partner working for Andreessen Hor Horowitz, the famous fund with over 35 billion in assets under management. And not, not only that, but I think they, they are famous for uh, headlines that we usually talk about, like software is eating the world, and it's true. And also that every company will be a fintech. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what Gab is doing there. Gabe is doing there with uh, fintech investments and especially uh, having a look into Latin America. He's from El Salvador. And well, we have Matias Van Tienen joining uh, originally from Buenos Aires, uh, working in another VC firm, very iconic Founders Fund, founded by Peter Thiel. Uh, and they led one of the biggest investments in a Latin America startup to date, uh, the Series D, uh, Kavak Series D in 21. For $185 million. And also, they lead no bank Series C. So, Matthias has a, a also some knowledge of what's happening in the region, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and to start, I would like to remember that VCs are all, also people. <laughs> Just kidding, friends. But I would love you to start by saying uh, something personal to us and something related to how you see your career evolving, what's one strength of your personality that you feel that uh, allows you to be a good investor? So if you want to start, Matthias. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, I don't know where Brian is, but I feel like I have to give him a shout out. He is the ultimate definition of a hustler. Uh, I, I spoke to him a few months ago and I told him I was getting married in, in Cartagena and he said, but can I please come? Can I please come? And he was the only person that came to my wedding that was, you know, invited himself. But it was a blast to have him there, and he, he brought a lot of energy. So, again, thanks, again, thanks for Brian, having me Brian, where here. are you? <laughs> so, yeah, just a little bit about me. Yeah, I'm from Argentina. I grew up there, and then I spent uh, some time in Miami, in New York, in, uh, in Shanghai, in Barcelona, in San Francisco, and now, now I'm back in Miami. So I've always got a, a, a bit of a kind of international uh, DNA to me. And, um, you know, to your question on, on, on how to be a, a really strong investor, to me, it comes down to um, building a unique set of experiences that enables you to connect with founders, uh, to be able to, to kind of see, pick, uh, and ultimately win the best deals. Um, and so my path, you know, to, to, keep, to keep, kind of be concise, um, I started at Inside Venture Partners in New York City, which to me is kind of the best platform for any young investor where your job at you know, 21 years old is to speak to as many founders as possible. Uh, that was back in 2013. In fact, I actually spoke to a lot of the early Latin America startups at the time, you know, companies that are now huge, you know, like, uh, like Nubem Shop and Mural, uh, even Astropay, which was kind of like the, pre the, the predecessor to, to DLocal. Um, then I got some operational experience in, um, by joining a startup. I, I moved to Barcelona. I learned what it's like to scale a team, scale a product, go to market. Um, and then coming back to investing, I spent two years at Alphabet doing growth investing um, and finally came to Founders Fund about four years ago. So I think, you know, having worked at, at, at three different global firms and having actually been at a startup to me gives me kind of that breadth of experience that enables you to, to, to again, to kind of learn how to pick, learn, learn how to see the best deals, pick the best deals and ultimately win them. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it there. Thank you. Gabby, you want to go next? Fantastic. Um, and thanks so much for having me. It's been a, a blast at the Latitude Summit. You guys have done an amazing job. Um, I think for me, investing is about people. Um, there's the financial side of it, of course. And, you know, it's about how you pick companies, how you vet companies, how you build your portfolio, how you drive returns. But I think behind all of that for me is people and how they make decisions, 
how they feel, their motivations, their fears. Um, and for me, um, I think my strength really builds from wanting to just understand what makes people tick and why. Um, I, don't come from, I don't come to venture from tech in working at a big tech company or working in finance. Um, I'm an engineer. I first worked in product development and R&D, doing consumer research, and so it was always thinking about people's needs and who they are and how do you build things that serve them well. Um, and so I think for me, in meeting founders at the early stage where I invest, it's about understanding who they are so that I can support them in that journey. Um, there's still the picking and the financial side and all of that, but to me, it's about people. Um, at Harlem Capital, we are a community fund, and so I think it fits well in that we really focus on how we build relationships with our LPs, with our founders, with our interns, and that community and our operator community. Um, and to me, you know, relationships are the foundation of success. So I guess looking back at the career, I mean, hopefully it's wildly you know, successful financially, but to me it's more important to build really strong relationships along the way. Awesome. Um, well, I'm very, very happy to be here. I've been having a great time in Brazil. Um, I think for me, I am, I was born in a very small country, El Salvador. So like, since I was born, nobody gave a chance for me to accomplish my dreams. I always had to work really, really hard to get to where I am. And that meant to like teaching myself English when I was in high school and open the doors to study in the United States through a scholarship. And then after that, trying to recruit for an investment banking job in New York and after that, going to a startup and then coming to Andreessen Horowitz and building a practice that didn't exist, which was the Latin American practice. And I think for me, what really differentiates and I think is special about me is that I can relate with founders about going from zero to one because nobody ever believed that I could do it. But at some point, you have to believe in yourself and your own skills. And that's what really helps me connect with founders. And that's why I always take the positive side when a founder is pitching to me, because I do know that life is about events of low probabilities, but that's what makes it so exciting. And you always have to fight for it. And you know, that's why I'm so bullish on the region. And you know, I, I'm a big supporter, obviously, of, of Latitude and what you guys are doing here. Hi, yeah. And we're so happy to have you. Gabe has been an amazing speaker to all our fellows, and we, we uh, know your, your looking to the region is unique. I will go back to you then with another question, Gabe. Uh, we know that A16Z is a fund that doesn't care about being super low profile and has like a strong brand. So what, how do you think this is important? How do you feel uh, this brand is built intentionally from the inside out? If you can give us a few uh, comments on that. Yeah, no, I think the power of the brand, the way that we think about it is that the true power is the network that you're able to create. Because when founders come and work with us, that means that they are trusting that we can help them with the most important problems that they have. So we have built an operating teams that help you from go to market, to marketing, to talent recruiting, and also with like pricing and all these different issues that you go when you start a company. And the reason why we decided to do that is because we want founders to have an all-in-one platform that they can rely to. And now what we have also launched the start program and all the way to our growth fund is that we want to be the partner that you can trust from the dream to your all the way to the IPO. And the thing that really differentiates the brand and I think is very, very important is that when Ben and Mark started, they were like, I want the founders that work with us to have the same network that Bob Iger at Disney has. So that is the power and, the, and a lot of my focus actually is in building that network in Latin America, talking to banks, talking to governments and thinking about regulation and giving guidance to our portfolio companies and, and helping them that way. So that's what we, how we think about brand and, and, and the power of the brand is it's all about the network. Amazing. Do you want to add anything from the perspective of Founders Fund or, or Harlan Capital on, on building a brand as a VC? Yeah, I can add. I think building a brand is one of the uh, was able to grow as quickly as we have. I think uh, so we're a fund that focuses on investing in women and underrepresented founders in the US, Africa, and Latin America. 
And I think for us, we really believe that it's hard to be what you can't see. And so at the very beginning, we were always very focused on elevating and talking about the great things that diverse founders are doing, what they're building, so we can really help to um, change the narrative about what people think diverse founders can build and are capable of. Um, and I think we've just seen the huge benefit that our content and our branding has done in terms of being able to help us win deals, source founders, kind of run the flywheel of uh, our fund. Yeah, I think you know the, the, the power of brand is incredibly important when it comes to venture capital. Ultimately, you want the best founders to kind of gravitate towards, towards your firm as opposed to having to chase them. And so I think it's important to, to be building a brand over the years. I think Founders Fund has... Um, has always really leaned into that, you know, starting with Peter and his personal brand, you know, the book Zero to One, having, you know, um, started PayPal and being kind of the first investor in, in Facebook, I think he had a very strong personal brand, but then bringing that into the firm and kind of how, what he built beyond that, um, and a lot of credit also to, to our branding team over the years, having created a differentiator brand that I think stands for uh, not being afraid to speak what we, be to say what we believe, if, even if it can be um, controversial or contentious uh, and kind of uh, being willing to 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 kind of talk about things that maybe can be politically incorrect or or, or, th or things like that, uh, but then also ha having a, a brand that stands for kind of uh, optimism around technology and the and the power that it can break that it can bring us, uh, having kind of the vision and and, and being bold and making really um, uh, kind of crazy bets like being the first institutional investor in SpaceX or investing in a lot of um, hard tech companies and so there's a lot of things that I think make up a brand, but it's important to continue to invest in it in order to be differentiated uh, and not consensus such that you can attract the best founders to your firm. Yeah, and I think it's amazing that we're seeing more and more opportunity for our founders in the region to be closer uh, to funds like yours, because like, I don't know if five years ago anyone would think that uh, Founders Fund or Jusser Horowitz will invest so uh, closely in, in Brazil and Latin America, and we're seeing more and more about that. So everyone, let's get some tips on how to better prepare while we're here. Uh, but uh, just wanted to touch a little bit more in the, um, the market that we're seeing right now in Latin America. Like we were talking the the uh, other panel about how to build diverse communities and the inclusion, the the importance of inclusion and diversity, and looking at our market is not mature enough to have that many uh, funds working towards niche or, or specific types of founders. Uh, I would love to hear from Gabi how uh, your thesis evolved, what, what you learned on the way in Harlan Capital, how uh, could we incorporate or be inspired about any of the learnings that you have with, with your thesis? Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. When we first started back in 2015, the market even in the US didn't have as big of a focus on diverse founders as you see today. Um, so I think the start of the fund was really bold and brave and visionary. And I think the team knew they were onto something but didn't yet know how big or impactful it might be. Um, so I'll rewind back to 2015. Um, our team, they were friends in New York City. They were working at a private equity fund and it was a black led private equity fund and they got inspired to start investing on their own. They started with small businesses in New York, but wanted to get into venture capital um, as an asset class because of the greater opportunities for returns and growth. And so then they did what a lot of us who start in venture do. They tap their network to find founders and startups. And in their network, uh, by nature being diverse themselves, were women and black founders and Latino founders. And as they talked with them, they started seeing this challenge that they were all facing of how difficult it was for them to raise capital. Um, they started doing research on the industry. They saw that 3% of VC funding is going to women and underrepresented founders. And this is a group that's like 70% more of the US population. And so as investors, they say, hey, there's this great market inefficiency. We got incredible people building great companies who don't have access to capital. There's an opportunity as an investor to invest in an overlooked group and make outsized returns. And at the same time, there's this opportunity for impact where you can help change the narrative about what people think is possible and who can start a unicorn company um, and really change the face of entrepreneurship by allocating capital to those people. Um, so that was really the origin of the fund. Uh, we started with a small angel fund. Today we're in our second fund. We have 175 million under management. We've invested in 48 companies in 13 cities and three countries. In the last year we've expanded to Latin America, Africa, we started investing in Web3, which is really exciting. 
Um, so it's been a really cool ride. I think we've learned that the industry and its focus on diverse founders ebbs and flows, right? You see a, a spike of funding to black founders after the death of George Floyd. You see more funding to women founders after the Me Too movement. And then now in this market where it's a little bit more challenging, investors have kind of pulled back in some ways. And so I really implore investors to think about investing in diverse founders, not because it's for impact, but because it is a great um, financial opportunity and you're missing out on incredible opportunities if you're not. Um, so for us, long term, we want to be a global fund, investing in every asset class, every geography. Um, and for that, that means doing well by doing good at the same time. That's amazing. And I, can, I feel I can make a parallel on how we feel in Latin America. Uh, maybe by uh, sometimes we think of us as like this diverse founder that will get to a global fund or to an American fund and will uh, make uh, cross uh, every challenge together, right? And um, it's becoming more and more a global uh, connection between founders and VCs. So I think that's great because the, as we were talking the entire day, the opportunities are huge here, right? So uh, whoever is not looking to Latin America is missing out. Uh, and I would love to hear from you, from you, Matias, on that same um, kind of line of thought about how's the complexity on operating multiple markets. And I know you work with international investments. So what does this bring in terms of, okay, I have m multiple options, but at the same time, how, how do you think about choosing them? Because it could be infinite yeah it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question and i think it's a it's, it's a real challenge but also a real opportunity uh, and, and as background you know investing internationally has always been a core part of my strategy across multiple different firms and so originally at insight we did a lot of european investing uh, with a lot of success some in latin america as well we even put a small check in viva real but back in the old days um so it's wow. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, so, so again, like, you know, to me, as somebody who's international, um, you know, why go compete in Silicon Valley where everybody's been there for decades? Why not kind of take my network and kind of go abroad and, and find, find the best deals abroad? Same thing at, at Google, you know, bringing in a UI path, which uh, at the time was like this crazy Romanian company coming, coming out of nowhere, ended up being kind of a huge success, uh, just past a, a billion in revenue last quarter. Um, and then again, at Founders Fund, you know, my thesis for joining is, Here's a firm that's done incredibly well in Silicon Valley and actually had already a few hits abroad. I mean, Spotify with Sean Parker, kind of legendary investment, DeepMind um, out, of, out of the UK. Um, and actually, Nubank, uh, you know, they led the Series C in a deal that I actually wanted to do while I was back at Google. Couldn't get them over the hump on Brazil, but um, ultimately, I, I saw this platform that could be scaled abroad and, and I jumped at the opportunity to do that. And to your question and the complexity, you know, we have a very lean team. Our entire investment team is only about you know, 14 people now managing billions of dollars. And so I think you have to be really ruthless with your time allocation. Ultimately, to be a good capital allocator, you need to be a good time allocator. And I think having this kind of broad mandate, uh, but a lean team forces you to be really focused. Um, and similar to a startup that has maybe now in this market kind of fewer resources, I think it really forces you to be focused to kind of just say no to most meetings or or to kind of really hone in on the things that really matter um, and ultimately uh, kind of drive returns that way. Amazing. Gabe, do you want to add anything about how when you got to A16Z and you saw the opportunity about uh, bringing more focus to Latin America, what are the top things that you thought uh, that you could do? And of course, the numbers are here, but it's not very easy uh, all the time to make the leap. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, <clears throat> I think for us, the, the numbers were there, but the big question is, how do you really crack the market without being in the market? And I think the unique insight that we got was that you could count, at the beginning of 2021, the unicorn founders in the region, we were like 31 at the time, I think if I'm not mistaken. And then what I decided to do is like, okay, so I can literally meet with all the unicorn founders that are also angel investors. And that way I don't have to rely on local partners for me to get access to the best deal flow. And that for me was like a, like a key insight. Hey, you just gave them a call? I reach out to them on LinkedIn or through a warm intro. <laughs> That's my type of personality and they responded. And you know, at the time I was not even focused on Latin America, I was focused on US healthcare. 
I was just started to build this this community. And you know, Brian is here, and, and he was one of the the people that helped me get connected with more founders. And I I wouldn't be sitting here because without the founders that actually decided to help me and was like, hey, let's build this case for Andreessen Horowitz to invest more in the region. So it's a product of you know having the initiative, but also the founders being able to help me. And then we created this WhatsApp group, and then we started sharing deals. And then the partners at Andreessen started to see all the deals and they're like oh wow this is actually very interesting and i think a lot of other vcs kind of rely on relationship for local vcs which we also partner a lot like all the deals that we've done we partner a lot but i don't want my lunch to be depending on someone else so that's why like we decide to build a network from the inside and be able to share opportunities with local funds so most of the time pretty much all the deals that we have done i pinged the local funds and be like, hey, would you be interested in participating with us? Um, so I think that that was the unique part of it. And one thing that I do wanted to mention is about non-traditional founders. For me, it's actually something important because I am from a non-traditional background. I've done 14 investments in Latin America in the last year. Half of them, the CEOs of those companies did not study in the United States. And that's for me like a big thing and that's why I'm learning Portuguese. Because when you have someone pitching you in a second language, you miss a lot of the context. And that's one of the things that we want to fix, and that's the next big thing that we want to focus on. That's amazing. Do you hear all this, everyone? So he gave on LinkedIn, and he will for sure take a look on what you have. Or come closer and be a part of Latitude because that's the type of uh, advice and people that we have in our network. Uh, and if you're here, it's because you believe also in the power of community. So that's what we're building here. And thanks to Brian that started this all, right? Uh, but okay, enough about what you do and how do you think of our world. Let's, let's give some advice uh, to the founders here. Um, so yeah, it's, we, we can run from this question, right? So we're from LATAM, we have a big advantage on the language. Sometimes we don't have the, the perfect background, not from Ivy League or, yeah. So all, all this uh, already comes with the package. Um, of course, apart from TAM and team that I think it was mentioned uh, this morning, um, what's there that you're looking for and that like, uh, would make you pay attention closer to a deal uh, and like really t try to, to learn more from a founder uh, from Latin America or anywhere. But what advice do you have for people that are trying to go for bigger uh, rounds and, and with global VCs? Uh, where, apart from TAM and team, I want to know what, what's the next thing that you look at? Whoever wants to start. I'm happy to go. I mean, what, one thing that I really care about is, um, is that you're, the reason why you're building a company. And, you know, we, uh, we're, uh, we're very averse to this concept of, like, the whiteboard founder that lists 10 ideas on a whiteboard. And, you know, you kind of start crossing them out. And then you build a company around, like, the one that sounds the least bad. I mean, that's, like, not a good recipe for starting a company. And if you look at the very, you know, the, the, the huge outcomes, the generational companies, you know, those are founders who are doing their, you know, their life's work and they have this 10, 20, 30 year vision for, for bringing their vision to reality. And so I think it becomes apparent very quickly in a pitch whether somebody is doing something because they want to make you know, some money or the, you know, the one maybe like the status that comes with being a founder um, or any number of other reasons that uh, when things get really tough and they inevitably will, um, you know, you won't have the, the stamina to kind of break through walls. And so to me, it, 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 needs, it needs to be very genuine um, kind of energy that, that you're doing your life's work. And that is when I get really excited about, about an investment. Yeah, I agree with that a lot. Um, I think I'd add, because we're at the early stage, we're always thinking about, all right, how are you thinking about getting to product market fit and validating what product market fit means for you and the business and, and the stage that you're at? And so one thing we always think about is, all right, do you know your customer, your end user better than they know themselves? Like what really drives them? Why do they need what you're building? Why is it a painkiller, not a vitamin? I think like understanding that the why, the founder's why, but also the company why um, for the end user is something that we think a lot about at, the, at that stage. Um, I think for us, we have this concept called the idea maze. So what this concept is about is, has the, has the founder thought about the problems so well that they know which turns 
uh, on the maze turned to death and which turns turned to the treasure. They also know who are the players of the maze, what were the casualties of the past, and which technologies can move the walls for the maze. So why we like this concept is that we want founders to have thought about the problem so well that there's nothing on the pitch that I can ask them that they don't know the answer for. If I am thinking about the problem for 20 minutes and I ask you a question that you don't know about the problem that you're solving, that's actually not a good sign. So that's kind of like how we measure the, the type of founder that we actually want to back. And I think advice for a lot of Latin Americans when they pitch to US VCs, and it happened to me a lot when I was interviewing for US firms, is that usually we try to overcompensate when we're like explaining on a second language and we try to ramble a little bit. So the best founders always have a framework and they always have like the key points that they want to touch and they have that clarity of thought. And I think that that's one of the big things that make a differentiation when you're fundraising, especially with USVCs that don't have a lot of context and you have to be very clear when it comes to explaining your business and the mission that you're solving for. Hi, yeah, Clary, I get it, love it. Okay, so I will ask you to think about an example uh, of a founder that you're super proud of, investor, or that you helped in your journey, or that surprised you in a good way. So let's, let's get inspired about the stories that you know, uh, whoever wants to start. I have one that I love. Um, it's, unfortunately, it's not Brazilian, it's, it's Argentinian. Um, but there's this company that we recently announced the, the, the round that is called Fudo. And why this story is so special is because the founder built the company nine years ago. And we just announced the seed investment. This guy has been working at this company for nine years. Is uh, Basically what they do is like software for restaurants. And during COVID, you know, the entire market went down. And what he decided to do is to double down. So he bought his co-founders that were like, you know, this is not going to work out. He buys them up. He goes to uh, one of the few advisors in Argentina and is like, hey, can you please help me? Because I want to take this business to the next level. This is the ninth year that he's operating this business. And he brings uh, one of the amazing CEO, which his name is Justo. And what I like this story so much is that when we look at this opportunity, Everyone, when I brought it to the partnership, was like, you know, what are you doing? Like, this company is like nine years old. Like, they barely just got to two million of AR at the time. And what I really like the, the, the opportunity is because this guy was in for the right reasons. Nobody in, probably in the, in the region knows so much about selling software because this guy has been doing it for nine years. So talking about the idea maze, and he was able to turn around the business even without receiving capital from the outside. So he was growing 2x year over year. And one of the things that we decided to do is like, okay, we can bring the resources that we have and help him turn around the business. And since we invested, it's been one of the most exciting companies that, that we've been working on. And the lesson for this and why we like it so much is that so many people think that you have to raise from, you know, XVC to make it happen. But in reality, the best founders just make it happen regardless of the capital. And I think Sergio Fogel was here earlier, and he's the best example of someone that built a multi-billion dollar business without raising capital. So of, of course, we're in the business of providing capital, but the best founders shouldn't be giving up their dreams just because a VC turns them down. And that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight about that story. And I'm curious to learn how, how did you meet him? Him? Oh, this is great. <laughs> so I was giving, um, I was part of the Latitude. Um, uh, oh, yes. yes, Angel Cohort. And then I met Frank Martin, who we also invested. <laughs> so I got two deals out of that. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. So, and then Frank was like, he, he built this company called Restaurando, which is kind of like the open table for Latin America. He ended up selling it to TripAdvisor. And I was like, hey, man, why don't you do the Toast for Latam? You have the perfect experience. He's like, well, I'm already helping the Toast for Latam. And it's this company called Fudo. And he's like, you should double click on this company. And that's how I got to do it. So, yeah, great, <laughs> great question. Yeah, um, 
The first one that comes to mind for me is uh, a company from our first fund. She's actually our first investment in that fund. And um, just really impressed with how she was able to turn the business around through COVID. Um, so the company is called Auntflow. Um, they're a B2B company that enables or helps any business, school, places where we gather have free menstrual products and bathrooms. Um, and so when COVID hit, no one was going to schools, no one's going to work, no one's you know, gathering anymore. And so everything in the business you know, completely stopped. Um, and so they really had a, a big decision to figure out, you know, how are we going to drive revenue for the business? How are you going to stay afloat at this point? Um, especially in an industry where capital is a little bit harder to come by, where um, you've already got a lot tied up in working capital and inventory. Um, but Claire, the founder, um, she realized a few things very quickly. Um, so think very beginning of COVID. What's the one thing no one has anymore? Masks. Everyone needs a mask. Um, but saw that as a business, they had manufacturing facilities. They had, were CDC compliant um, and had to make a really big decision. Do we take this million dollar capital that we've got um, from our recent round and do we just invest it into making masks to sustain the business? Um, so it was a really tense board meeting, really tough conversation. Um, but I think what came out of it was that Claire had such self-confidence and belief in herself and this aunt flow going forward, wherever that would be. The board and the founder, um, seeing how she'd gone through different troubles and trials throughout the, the business and her ability to figure it out. Um, so ended up deciding to, to make the investment, um, ended up producing masks. Uh, the business then 3 x in the year, did really well, then went on to raise a $10 million Series A later on from a, a larger fund. Um, and the business is now back to doing what they were originally doing, but seeing the growth that they saw in that vertical, decided to add new product lines for other products that businesses and schools will end up needing. And so ended up being a really cool outcome for the business. Um, but I say that to share, like similar to the story that Gabe shared, um, founders who just get it done no matter what, they believe in themselves, they understand what they're building and what, who they're serving and figure out how to get through challenging times. I, there's not only one path, right? And we all, uh, it's not like, oh, go raise your pre-seed, raise your seat, raise your seat. Sometimes you're nine years and then you meet Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Matias, you have any story? Yeah, here I would focus on um, Carlos Garcia, who is the, the founder and CEO of Kawak. I mean, what, what these guys have pulled off in the last two years, if nothing short of miraculous, I think they're building the hardest startup to pull off in Latin America, full stop, and it's not even close. I mean, they're literally scaling a business that, you know, you have plenty of, uh, of logistics, inventory, financing, uh, you're sourcing the, the, the cars, you're reconditioning them, you're selling them, um, you're raising billions of capital, uh, and you're doing it uh, while scaling internationally, which few Latin American startups have been able to pull off. And if you think about what happened in the last few years, you know, with, uh, with, when the pandemic initially hit, they had to kind of almost like cease operations to abide by all the COVID protocols. Um, then as, uh, as the market really started taking off, they went from basically pausing operations to growing like crazy, um, scaled from you know basically a, a few thousand cars a year to 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 a very very high volume, um, and then now that the market inevitably turned, uh, you see them kind of pulling back from growth into profitability, and it's, it's something that you can toggle much more easily if you're a software or, or a fintech company. But if you're if you're a company with real assets with real logistics, it's it's incredibly complex. You know thousands of employees again across multiple markets, and so I think. The resiliency that team has shown has, is, is truly kind of just hats off. Um, and I think that's what makes them so defensible. I think nobody in their right mind would, would try to compete with Kavak uh, at this point in their markets. Uh, so to me, that's kind of like the, the, the shining example of a, of a team that's shown that resilience through adversity and uh, super bullish uh, over the long haul. Hiring stories, we have a ton. Uh, I'm gonna go to a question from the app now. So thank you so much for everyone that's been submitting amazing questions. Uh, I, it's funny that's from uh, an angel from our fellowship. So they are very active in our community. Gabriel uh, was here. I talked to him, and he asked, "How another Gabriel? Oh my God! Yeah, third one on the panel. It's a beautiful How, name. <laughs> yeah, I love it. The angel." Um, how has the current environment influenced or modified your, your decision-making process uh, when investing? So the two years, I think we all heard from Julio this morning about 
what happened is not that this year is strange, it's the two past years that have been like crazy. So, but now we're adapting um, and like kind of uh, seeing where we stand, right? So it, if this has changed something in your decision-making process, um, how, w what would it be? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a few things. I mean, there's the obvious ones, right? Like um, you're definitely funding companies that have much higher uh, cash efficiency that they're not dependent on, on raising more capital. Um, I think maybe that's kind of the, the biggest fallacy that a lot of people had over the, the, the last few years. And, you know, I think every VC made mistakes. You know, we made mistakes. Um, I think the assumption that you could fund the company and that within six months or a year, they could raise another round at a quick markup, uh, you know, on, 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 uh, basically be able to access cheap capital on an ongoing basis. And now I think when you underwrite an investment, you need to be sure that they can either get to profitability or that they're going to hit the milestones required where you feel really confident they can raise more capital to kind of turn over another card, so to speak. And so I think um, you need to make sure that when you're investing in a business, there's, there's going to be a, a clear path to, to profitability. And that means that either your, the business needs to be very capital efficient or, or if they're not, that the round you're putting together provides enough capital to, to get to that milestone. And that might mean that it's going to be kind of higher dilution uh, in this new environment. Um, but I think you're, you're going to see fewer investors willing to bet that some other investor is going to come in and, and fund the, the ongoing burn. Question. It's a good question. Um, it's, in, it's funny. One of our values at the fund is that process is religion. And so many ways, we've been very consistent, even in the last two years and how things have changed really rapidly. Um, and I think in our decision making, uh, we really try to prioritize speed and certainty for founders. Speed in our process in terms of how we diligence, given that we're focused on a few categories, we're focused on specific founders. Um, and then certainty in that like, when we've made a decision, we're ready to go. There's not a bunch of back and forth. It's a pretty quick and smooth process overall. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably one thing, at least on that side. I think the second is perhaps more around this, like to um, the point earlier, uh, the bar has just gotten higher. And so what we're looking for has changed a little bit. Um, but I think fundamentally, overall, our process itself is the same. Yeah, I think similar for us, not a lot has changed. And I actually have a spicy take on this, <laughs> uh, specific to Latin America. Um, so like when Andreessen was founded, like the entire thesis was software is hitting the world. And the way to summarize that, that software outcomes were going to get larger over time. So a lot of the criticism that the firm got at the beginning was, oh, these guys are owning 7% of this business. And our competitors used to do the math and be like, oh, you have to believe that these guys will have to have $80 billion outcomes or like $50 billion outcomes. And that at the time was unheard of in, in Silicon Valley. It was not very, very common. Well, it ended up happening. So I think that in Latin America, you know, Nubank is just the very beginning of it. I think outcomes in Latin America are going to get larger. And this is me pitching you that I focus a lot on the early stage. Obviously, where, where Matias is focused on is, is a, a lot harder when it comes to making this type of decisions. But on the early stage side, I cannot miss a deal because it's too expensive. Like, the best deals, and this is something that Jeff Jordan says all the time, which is a general partner at Andreessen, is if you put the overpriced bucket on a separate bucket, it's always the best bucket. So I'm not going to miss a deal just because it's overpriced at the seed or the Series A. I need to be part of that. So I think that outcomes in Latin America are going to get larger over time. And maybe it sounds crazy that I overpriced. And, and Matias, we were talking about Figma and how controversial at the time was that investment in the early stage. But I think that's a great example of something that I think eventually will happen in the region, that outcomes are just going to get larger. Amazing. I want to do a uh, check produção aqui if we have Mike Rieger or if I need to be like uh, making up some questions here while we, <laughs> we find him because in 10 minutes uh, he will be with us online. Produção, if everything is good, just let me know. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so I, I want to um, ask that you think about the few, the next years. Brian will call you in 10 years and ask you to come back to the 10th edition of Amos Latam. 
that will be, I don't know where, but it will be huge and with amazing people for sure. Um, and you continue investing, you continue looking to Latin America. When you come here, what's the story that you want to tell about this past 10 years since today? Uh, what, what are like your dreams and, and being positive, let's say on a positive note, that we're all here uh, working to have a better region with more development opportunities. So what's, what's your big dream about uh, the work that you're doing if you're back here in 10 years, something that happened? Sorry, that was not a prepared question. No. I never sent to you, but yeah. Oh, wow. So in 10 years, I'll be the president of El Salvador. Let's start with that. <laughs> and um, no, I think uh, I would love to see that, that the ecosystem has developed so much that you cannot create a WhatsApp group with all the unicorn founders. <laughs> and second of all, no, that, uh, that not only Sao Paulo has grown, but like cities like Rio de Janeiro, Curitiba, you know, Monterrey, Mexico, like all these small hubs that are right now happening across Latin America, that they have grown and can support larger outcomes. So that, that for me will be the dream. And that governments actually believe that technology can change the way that we operate. And I think the Central Bank of Brazil has done a great job in, in financial inclusion. And I think that that's, that's actually the guide to follow for the rest of Latin America. So I think, uh, I do believe that, that if you don't have the natural resources like a country like El Salvador, where I'm from, the only place that you can go from zero to one is through technology. And I would love that to happen across the region. I think for me, 10 years from now, it's that we've, as a fund, have really worked to help change the face of entrepreneurship within Latin America. That we come back to the Latitude Summit, it's bigger, it's better. All of the founders, the investors, and the fund companies they're funding reflect the diversity of the region and of the cities we're in, of Sao Paulo, of Rio, of elsewhere. Um, that we've invested in companies that have changed lives, that have helped create generational wealth for um, you know the funds, founders, the employees, their families, and it, and it just continues the that virtuous cycle in the ecosystem as we go forward. Yeah, for me. Um what I would love to see over the next 10 years is a lot more Latin American companies just thinking globally. And, uh, you know, some speakers have alluded to this uh, throughout the course of the day. But if you look at Europe, you look at Asia, they've produced companies with, with huge global ambitions that have become massively valuable. Um, you know, ByteDance, probably best example coming out of China. Um, uh, you have uh, Miro and UiPath and Salonis coming out of, the, uh, out of Europe, you know, plenty of others as well. And I think in, in Latin America, you're starting to see it. And there's maybe, you know, two or three examples, um, you know, Auth0 being a phenomenal success. Um, and there's going to be a combination of, of Latin American companies. And, you know, people do need to build for Brazil, for, you know, for Mexico, for Latin America. But at the same time, I think there is an immense amount of talent down here. And I see no reason why uh, Latin America can't build, you know, like a 50, $100 billion company that serves... Uh, either consumers or, or enterprises all over the world. So that would be my, my aspiration for the region. And to end, I, I would love to ask you a last question about uh, what you didn't get right. I love, uh, uh, I forgot what's the name of the VC, but it's a huge one in the US that has a page about everyone that they didn't invest. Like Mark Zuckerberg got there and the guy said, go away, right? <laughs> So what's the story that you have that's someone that you pass and you said, oh my God, I have a lot to learn from it. If you don't want to say the name, fine, but uh, I, I bet you never, like, there, there's not a chance that you did only 100% of, of uh, big, uh, like, wins, right? So if anyone has a story on something that you wish you did different. Sure. I, um, so we just started investing in the region in our second fund. Our first fund was in 2019. Uh, we saw this company um, that one of the partners knew. They went to business school together in Colombia called Foodology. Um, and at the time, we were still new. Uh, we weren't able yet to invest in the region. Um, but looking back, I think that's one that all of us on the team, we love the team, love what they were building. I think it's an incredible opportunity. Um, I wish we were able to partner with them on that journey. Yeah, the, I think you were, what you're referring to here is like the anti-portfolio, which I think yes, Bess exactly. Bessemer is the one that, that has this on their website, if I recall. Um, yeah, there's definitely been scars over the years. Uh, so, you know, sometimes it's your own mistake. Sometimes you're unable to persuade your team. You know, there's any number of reasons. Um, 
you know, one, one that's relevant to, to Latin America is, you know, I, I spoke to Sergio Fogel in like 2013 when there was like a tiny little company called Astrope and I was like, what is this super weird thing? Like, I just could not understand it. Um, and, uh, and I neglected it over the years. I didn't track it um, li like I should have. And, you know, kind of seeing almost, you know, they kind of came out of nowhere in the last two or three years and have built, you know, this kind of amazing multi-billion dollar company that um, surpassed just being a, a Latin American company uh, now operating kind of in, in many different countries all over the world. And so I think maybe not having paid enough attention to the early stage startups that would kind of take maybe 10 years to mature, but then achieve incredible success. That's probably maybe the deepest scar that I have. Abe, you have the last one. So I think for me, it's too early to tell, to be honest. Um, Cop one out. as a firm. <laughs> one, one as a firm that we do regret, uh, obviously, is Nubank. Uh, a lot of people, thankfully, think that we're in Nubank, but we're not. <laughs> and um, I think that that's one that I asked the partners and, you know, is one of the main things that they wanted to fix. And, you know, sometimes because you miss those type of opportunities, you change the framework. And I am a beneficiary that we did that. So, you know, hopefully you can find the next 10 new banks. <laughs> Thank you so much for being transparent and constructive. And we hope you, we see you a lot here in Brazil and in the whole region. Thank you so much, everyone.